I'm Mick Waters, if you don't know me. Deborah said, would you come along and say a few words at the end? And I, I, I sort of say, I think, what do you say, really? Um, it, it's been really smashing, hasn't it? In all sorts of ways, to listen to somebody talking about the work that you can do uh, to take your children's learning to a different level. And she began by talking about the, the dilemmas we're in, the sort of uh, watering it down and shrinking it and getting it down to where we are with SPAG, or really trying to get children to into literature or beauty of words or whatever. And then got into this thing about conscience. How do we give children a think through the conscience and then get into the dilemmas that we've seen at the very end. So a dilemma comes out in two ways. The dilemma of the pressure of <coughs> the sort of external world fighting with what we know to be right, but the dilemmas that children could see around the world. I, I just... Wonder whether we might have a minute before we go out. Just why don't you turn to the person you started talking to a little bit ago, and say, so if we're sort of persuaded, there's a nice big idea, isn't it? Persuaded by some of the ideas that Deborah was talking about, what do we need to do in schools then to shift more of the experiences of children towards the things that she was on about? Okay, because otherwise we just go away tomorrow, uh, go away today, and go back to work on Monday and carry on with the spag, <laughs> and the tests, and the copying. I know you don't, but it's everywhere across the system. So what, what is it, what, 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 if you like, what's stopping us doing it then? Well, just a minute or two, go on, have a squirt, now we'll finish off. <laughs> what time do you <laughs> So ever so quickly, I, I don't know what you're talking about, and if we start trying to have a big conversation across the room, it'll take a long while. What you've just been doing is a plenary. <laughs> no, I just tell you that, because they're dying out in England, because uh, Ofsted aren't looking for them anymore. They're not happening so much. If you want to look at the power of Ofsted, you watch how things creep through in England like foot and mouth, <laughs> just, just in front of Ofsted inspections. And then when they stop looking, they start dropping away. Plenaries were everywhere a couple of years ago, and they, they became perfunctory. Actually, a good plenary is a really, really... What Deborah was doing a lot with those children was an ever-moving ever plenary. Why is this happening? What's happening? What, what's the point of this? What, why are we trying to learn about this? What are you getting from this? That's plenary work. That's helping children to keep sort of lifting above it and thinking into it. They often call it metacognition, sort of getting above things and looking at as they're learning as they're doing it. And plenary has got so perfunctory. The number of times I heard poor teachers, you know, right, stop, stop. We've been going half an hour. Stop, stop, stop. I know you're interested. Stop, right. <laughs> stop. We need to show progress, right. Who can tell me what we've been doing for the last 30 minutes? And you saw children looking at teachers thinking, have you got short-term memory loss? <laughs> you were here. You found it. You did it. Now, that's not a plenary. A plenary is where you start. So I don't know what you've been thinking about, but you might have been thinking, well, actually, one of the things that we need to do is that phrase I heard several times in the hall this morning. We need to be less afraid, braver. Now, I'm not sure why we need to be brave 
to think that we can ask some children to imagine they're doing some things that come very natural to them. It's brave because somebody else might question it, isn't it? Mm. There's a bravery in the fact that somebody might come in and say, where's the evidence? Right? Now, I think, actually, the evidence speaks volumes for itself. But it's really hard to say that when you're the only person in school perhaps trying to help something to happen. So I'd have thought that one thing, one thing we need to do to move it on is get more people to have the nerve to try and do things in a different way with children. I think one of the big problems for teachers is that traditionally we're supposed to deliver things, convey things. And actually what we're trying to do in this case is get children to pull them from the learning, to take it for themselves. And that's a much more difficult thing to do. Because the danger is, when we look at what Deborah was on about, we see something being inc somebody being incredibly imaginative, somebody being cre incredibly able to construct scenes for children, being able to say, this tree has lived for all these hundreds of years. And we go, oh, I don't know if I dare do that, don't know if I can. We have enough trouble singing in front of children. How are we going to expose some of our own fears or wonders? What if they say something I'm not ready for? Because I've got to show I'm prepared. And so what we do, uh, the dilemma, I think, is getting teachers to have the nerve in the concept of not knowing everything in front of their children as well as in front of the grown-ups who might come in. And I think they're really big things for the profession. Unless we work together on it, if we try and do it in our own class, it's really, really difficult. Working together on things is worth it. I, I am against the clock, but I will show you these, just to reassure some of you who do, if you like, teach things that have to be taught. I, I just put these on ever so quickly. These are, I, if I had longer, I'd give you a chance to sort of think about these. There's some work we've been doing where I work in the black country with uh, some secondary and primary schools. It's one of our um, cross the transition little projects we do. If I had time, I'd give you, I'd give you a lot of time to talk, but... In there, these are all examples of why people move. Why people move. Why do people shift? So A, are people who move because they're under threat, the evacuees and the Mayflower. B is where you're told to move and forced to move, uh, the partition of India and the reservations. C is where you're travelling for the better life, the Titanic and the wind rush and all the sort of 1950s stuff. And D, the bottom one, is where you move because you're taking somewhere over, the Romans and the Vikings. You're inserting yourself on a new community. All of those things are actually in the traditional curriculum that gets taught to children in schools. All of those things are often seen in schools as part of the normal learning children do about. And I think the challenge for teachers is to do the plenary bit get under the surface and talk to the children, not just about the Mayflowers making a run for it, and set, the, the Pilgrim Fathers making a run for it and setting up in New England, but actually why they did it and what was happening to them. And things like the Titanic, instead of just having nice models of what it was like in the upper class and what it was like in the steerage, why were the steerage people down there trying to make it across that ocean? Why did they pay good money to make it into a different world. So I haven't got time to do it in, a, in big ways, but you know, all these are examples of people who are escaping persecution. Crossing the Red Sea is in nearly every scripture. So when we teach about crossing the Red Sea, it's not just that miracle about it, it parting the waves and everybody running across. It actually is about why, why people were doing that in the first place and what they were trying to get to. The number of schools that do this evacuation thing. I go in schools in Tyrold and say, oh, we, we did evacuation yesterday. We put our, our clothes on, we carried our suitcases, and we had labels, and we went on a train, and it was really good. And I think the challenge is to say, you know, when those children were evacuated, they didn't know they were coming back. They were scared witless. They stood on stations with their brothers and sisters, wondering who would get them and take them off to a different life and whether they would see their parents again. They were hungry. You had a picnic. So let's get it real now. We had the experience. Let's take it further and take it on. This bright up, my granddad went to catch the Titanic. He was off to set up a new family, a new home in, in Canada. 
And he went to catch the Titanic. And he was going to send for his family. And his wife was going to go there. And my dad was going to go as a little child. He missed it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. He, he, he was, the crowds to get to the Titanic were so, so busy, it went without him. He missed it. Can you imagine when he got back to his village? All his mates in the pub said, well, I thought we were going there on that boat. He's been on about it for months. What a prat he must have felt <laughs> until two days later. Mm -hmm. eh? Two days later. He went a year later to Canada, but I never became Canadian. The Windrush people, you know, these were, these were the £10 ponds. You know, people paid £10 to go to Australia. <laughs> if they wanted to come back, pay the full whack. Yeah. You know, it's a little investment, but it's a big one. It's your future. It's the same about Talking to these children about people who are displaced forcibly, these Uganda nations. You know, the Indian partition was an awful example of British Empire. You know, what can we talk about? You know? These are those awful examples of children sent to Australia. The children's homes children, do you remember? And the, and the, the t Tibetan people displaced all the time. And then you can do the invasions, which we already do. But at the minute, children are seeing this on the television, whenever the television can be bothered. It sort of hits the news for a bit and goes out again. But these children, and you, these families forcibly moving, these are children. You know, this is conscience-led teaching. These are children your age, not your age, but children of the age you teach. You know, they're in these massive camps. This is the Syrian refugees. This is the, I do some work for UNICEF. These massive camps where children find themselves in. Sort of, and they're coming across. There must be something making these people move across Africa towards a better life that's very similar to the people in the Titanic. Very similar to the people in the Mayflower. These are human things that people do. This is more important. Did you get the sentence right? Did you get your fronted advert? This is big stuff. Look, this is a United Nations camp. And we're talking about character. Our DFE puts out a list of characteristics, resilience, motivation. These children show it in absolute endless amounts. So talking to our children about migration in the context with which Deborah taught, might be different from simply saying, should we feel sorry for them? Should we welcome them? Should we send them back? It's actually understanding that humans do it. And we do it for all sorts of reasons. And we always have. Thank you. Stop there. Yeah. <laughs>